Hello, this is Dr. Schrader, and today I'm going to talk to you about some of the uh, basic tools and devices that we can use in measuring and uh, surveying. So, um, as we know, surveying, we're, we're talking about uh, angles, we're talking about distances, we're talking about elevations, and uh, surveying is very old, very old profession. Uh, goes back uh, to the ancient civilizations. Uh, so a lot of the methods and the tools are still applicable today. Uh, the most common tool now is what's called the total station. And it is pretty much all electronic. And what it will do is it'll tell you your angles, your distance, and your elevation. And what it does is it is it measures the time it takes for a uh, radio wave to travel from the instrument to a prism and back again. And using these measurements and the power of uh, equations and uh, trigonometry, it calculates for you what your angles are, what your distances are. But what happens if you don't have a total station handy? Uh, total stations are not inexpensive. So if you're just starting out or you just want to do a survey, for example, uh, let's say you want to do a survey, you're, uh, you're digging a, a, a koi pond in your backyard and you want to do a survey to uh, f make sure you got the elevations right and the location right. Well, you may not have access to a total station because total stations cost thousands of dollars. There are simple pieces of equipment that we can use to uh, get this information and uh, they give you perfectly valid results. It's a perfectly valid survey. It's just using old fashioned equipment. Now remember, this is the equipment that we used when we laid out the United States. So as the surveyors laid out the country from east to west, they didn't have total stations, uh, they had very old, primitive, what we would now call primitive equipment, uh, and had to do things by hand. But yet, they were able to survey it so well. So these old pieces with some adaptations uh, work just as well as a total station. Uh, if you're working as a professional surveyor, my recommendation is always use the best equipment available. If that is your career and your job, uh, always use the best equipment. But if you're somebody who only needs to survey periodically, maybe once or twice a year, or you just need a couple quick shots on a site, uh, you may not have access to all that equipment, and that's okay. Uh, I'll show you a couple pieces of equipment uh, here in this little demonstration uh, that you can use. And again, these are just some common pieces of equipment that surveyors have used over the years. So if you're ready, I'm ready. So here we go. So this here, this is what's called a tripod. So total station, theodolite, transit, level, uh, they all sit on a tripod. This is what holds my instrument in place. These are also used when I use a total station to hold the target in place. So a lot of times you'll see a tripod with this little thing looks like a reflector sitting on top of it. That's the target. That's what's called the prism. That's what a surveyor is shooting at to get a, a distance, an elevation, an angle, uh, is that prism. And you'll set these on tripods because once you get the tripod level, uh, that's it. You don't have to worry about it. And it makes it more hands-free, uh, a lot more easy uh, to maintain. Tripod. Uh, used to be survey crews were extensive. You'd have uh, the note taker, you'd have an instrument person, and you'd have multiple rodmen. Those were the people who held the target. And you'd have multiple chainmen. Those were the people who'd actually have to take a chain, a literal chain, and measure off distances. And when they say a chain, a chain is 66 feet. Each one of those chains has 100 links in the chain. That is how the survey was using a chain. We use a similar concept in football, for example. So when we mark off the down and 
did they make the 10 yards in four tries? Sometimes the officials will get out the chains and you'll actually hear them move the chains. They move the chains. So that really kind of relates to how we're surveying. Is we at we physically used a chain. And as technology advanced, of course, we went more to tapes, uh, both steel and cloth. And you know, now we've gotten into the electronics with the total stations and electronic distance measuring. <clears throat> but up until the past 30 years, with the advent of uh, the electronics, we used the old-fashioned technology. And so even after it became a tape, it was still called a chain, and you'd have to have dedicated people just to pull that chain, just to measure that, to make sure you're getting good measures. So a survey crew could be extensive. So for example, the survey crews that laid out like state boundaries uh, for uh, Minnesota and Wisconsin and uh, the neighboring states, you'd have a crew of 30 people because not only would you have uh, a recorder and somebody running the instrument, you'd have your rod man, you'd have your chain man, and you'd have to have a whole bunch of support staff to help these people out. Uh, cups, uh, you know, people to fix, you know, blacksmiths to fix the tools when the tools broke, uh, lumberers to cut down any trees that were in the line of sight. Um, you know, uh, people who knew how to make boats, for example, because a lot of times you had to take canoes or boats uh, to lay your line. So survey crews would be enormous back when the country was expanding. And it would take months, if not years, to survey one line. So if you read about the adventures of the survey crews, it's pretty awesome how much they went through and the fact that they were able to survey these lines so well is just amazing. So these were dedicated professionals uh, who knew the craft inside and out. And they not only knew how to survey and how to use their tools appropriately and how to be efficient, but they also understood the science, the mathematics, what these numbers meant, how to apply this data so that when they were setting up uh, state boundary corners, that they knew they were right. And we have a lot of confidence in the early surveys, uh, despite the fact of the hardships of using uh, uh, some cruder tools, they did a fantastic job. So it's not necessarily the tool, it's how you use them and do you understand what you're doing, the application, and do you understand what to do with the numbers, what the mathematics tells you? So they had tripods. That was a pretty common, uh, and still is. Tripod is one of the things you're going to see with every survey. So this is my tripod. And the instrument I'm going to show you. So normally, we do not store the instrument with the tripod. Normally, we will take the instrument and we will remove it. This is what we do. We remove the instrument from the tripod after every use. We always put our tools away. We never want to leave them. And part of that is it's easy to knock over a tripod. So let's say I got my tripod stacked up, it falls over. If I've got the instrument on it, I've just destroyed the instrument. And when you're talking about instruments that cost thousands of dollars, we don't really want to destroy instruments. So uh, surveying practice is always that when you are not using the instrument, you take it off the tripod and you put it away. And that goes when you're out in the field too. If you are done with your shot, you don't move the tripod and the instrument together. You physically remove the instrument off the tripod, put it back in its case, carry your tripod, and carry your instrument. So let's say I'm uh, surveying out uh, across a field. So what happens, what could happen is if I'm carrying the instrument and tripod together, let's say I trip, uh, there's a hole I didn't see, or uh, you know, just something happens and I fall. If I'm just carrying the tripod, the only thing that's gonna happen is my tripod's gonna fall. But if I have that instrument on the tripod, 
even when they're moving it from place to place in the field. Then the issue becomes, I can destroy the instrument as well. So typically, uh, we typically try not to carry the instrument on the tripod itself, it, especially if we're going a long distance when we're surveying, or let's say we got across a creek or go up the side of a hill. Uh, anything like that, we will remove the instrument and put it back, carry it separately in its own case, and then carry the tripod. So my instrument here is in this case, and when I remove the case, there is the instrument. So in this particular case, this is what's called a dumpy level. Uh, it's an old time level. And uh, the newer levels are called self level levels. So once you get them leveled in one direction, uh, they automatically adjust. The, the way you can tell the difference between a dumpy and a self leveling is the number of feet. Uh, a dumpy level will have four feet, a self leveling level will typically have three. So that, that's a, an indication. Uh, the newer instruments will typically have only three feet. So uh, I can screw my uh, instrument in here, and what I do is I'll go this direction and level it, then I go this direction and level it, and I keep with that cycle until I get it level. So I screw it in, and then uh, we level one direction, however we need to to level this guy out, and then we level this direction, and same same principle here. We want to level that out and we keep going back and forth uh, until we get a level. So it, it's an iterative process on leveling it. Same concept with uh, uh, a three foot level. Same thing. You want to go, uh, you put the instrument directly over two, level it, put the instrument over the other two, level it. So with a, a, a three foot the three one, uh, you'll do it three times. So we level these guys out. And see, this has got a little wobble. So we know that's not good. We don't want it to wobble on there. We want that to be nice and firm. So you could see that was wobbling a little bit. We don't want it to wobble. So we want this to be nice and firm when we level it out. And that is a common mistake that people will make is they'll level it out and not realize that it's got that little wobble in it, and so it doesn't stay level. So we want to make sure that we stay level. So let's see if we can get this dude here to level. So there we go. We got we got him level that way. And we'll go over on this side here. And with with these, what you do is you have to do them simultaneously. So as this one screws down, you have to screw this one up, and that's what keeps it from wobbling. Because you go in opposite directions. So I'm leveled this way, uh, and I'm leveled this way. Okay, so that's how we level. So here I'm level in this direction. And I'm moving in this direction. So this is what's called the scope. And this is the focus. I look through my eyepiece there. And I want to focus in. Now on <clears throat> this scope, all I have is a, a, a cross. Just a, a, a cross sight. Like you find on a, a, a rifle, for example. Um, on other ones, you'll find uh, it's a cross, but it's got another horizontal line above the center and one below the center. Those are called stadia lines. And you can use stadia line to do very, very quick and uh, reasonably accurate uh, measurements of distance. So uh, if you have one that has three horizontal lines, uh, you can use the top line and the bottom line in your sight to do a stadia circle. And so that eliminates the need for a chain because you can go ahead and use those. And there's some uh, mathematical formulas that you use. And it gives 
relatively good results. Uh, <coughs> Stadia do. <coughs> this particular site, being a much older level, uh, does not have that ability. So you cannot do Stadia with this particular one because it just has these single horizontals uh, running through the center of the site. So this is my dumpy level. So uh, as I was mentioning before, what you'll have sometimes too, uh, either a tripod or some kind of stand with a target on top. And so with my uh, total stations, uh, and my more electronic distance measuring devices, uh, I'll have something like this, it will look like a post. And sometimes you'll see posts like this and they'll have the numbers marked on there. That's called a level rod. So it'll actually have uh, units of uh, fractional feet. And there's a pattern and each point represents one one hundredth of a foot on the scale. And they're typically, uh, <coughs> the shortest ones are about eight foot, they're tall, they, they telescope, uh, they come 15 feet, uh, I've seen some 25 footers, uh, various different sizes. Uh, they're pretty much fiberglass now, and the reason why they went to fiberglass, the old fashioned ones were either wood or aluminum. And the problem with aluminum is if you got too close to electric lines, with your rod, you can get electrocuted. So now they're fiberglass, uh, they're grounded. Uh, you still don't want to go by power lines, but you don't have to worry about the arc if you get too close, it arcing over. So uh, that was an enhanced safety feature. And the fiberglass ones are much lighter to carry, are much lighter, so they're easier to transport. Uh, the wood ones and the, the metal ones were, were quite heavy. So transporting them long distance could be an issue if you had to go a long distance out from where your instrument was to take your shots. Uh, it was quite a workout. So with the fiberglass, that's made it a lot easier. But don't be, you'll see them and they're, they're rounded or a lot of times they're oval shaped. Uh, the older ones are square. The newer ones are round and they telescope up and down. And they're a post similar to this. <clears throat> so. That's where the second person comes in. So the first person is what's called the instrument man. And uh, I guess you could call it the instrument operator, instrument person, but the technical term is instrument man, and it's uh, because of the limitations of the English language, it really applies to both genders. Uh, it is not gender specific. And <clears throat> they are the ones to run the instrument. So the instrument man, they are in charge of the instrument. They are in charge of its care of its transportation. That is their job. So whoever that instrument man is, that's a very important job uh, to make sure that instrument. When they get back to the office, it is up to them to uh, maintain the instrument, put it away, uh, clean. You want to clean the lenses. Uh, on it, especially if you're in an area and it's like dusty and you get dirty, that is the job and the function of the instrument man to maintain and operate that instrument. So they not only have to know how to operate the instrument, how to level it, how to shoot shots, uh, they also have to know how to maintain it. And that is their function. The rod man <clears throat> is the person who goes out uh, and provides the shot for the instrument man. So uh, it, it's a, a hard job because, well, the instrument man is pretty much is stationary and staying at one point while they're making their shots. And, they, and, and you could make multiple uh, sites in one, at one sitting of your instrument, uh, especially if you, if you have to do side shots. Uh, the rodman is the one who has to go out there to give sight for the instrument man to take the shot. So one of the issues, <clears throat> that Rodman would have, look at my piece of equipment here. And so this becomes another necessary piece of equipment. It's a level. Uh, it doesn't have to be a very big level, just a small level. This is just a little torpedo level. <clears throat> because you want to make sure that when you hold your instrument, I mean, you want to make sure that when you hold that rod, you have to hold the rod up to take to take uh, 
elevations, for example, one that's got the, the numbers on it, the scale, you have to make sure that you're plumb. Because if you're not plumb, and he's taking shots off of here, this is not going to be the correct elevation. So let's say these are elevation marks. Let's say this is elevation three. So if I'm holding it here, and the instrument band shoots three. Okay, so instrument band shoots a three. She's shooting a three right here. And I'm holding it here. I'm not going to have good data because I'm leaning. So I have to hold this guy plumb. So I, I take my little level here and I hold it plumb. And now, if she's shooting, she's going to be down below the three, isn't she? Because now we're straight, so it's like Pythagoras. So she'll actually be below three. Uh, and how much that that error is going to be is depending on how much I was leaning and how far up on the scale she was reading. So the higher up on the scale she's reading, the more the error by not being plumb. So uh, it behooves you, if you're a gelatinist, to bring yourself a little level and you level this guy up. Just like that. So a level becomes a key piece of equipment, uh, especially if you're the, the robot. Because, again, the instrument has its own level in the instrument itself. But the rod becomes important. Now, uh, a lot of times, if if they're close enough, if the rod and the instrument are close enough, uh, so I go out and I'm holding it crooked, and she's going, wait a minute, you're crooked. So she'll do something like this. So if I start seeing hand signals like this, that means I'm crooked and straighten it up. And what you can do if you don't have a level is you swing your rod like a pendulum, just like this, so that you know that somewhere along the arc that you're swinging, you're going to be vertical. And so what the instrument then will do, so what she will do when she's shooting me is she will take the lowest value that she gets as I go through this arc, and that's going to be the number she records. So that's one way uh, that we can do that. So this, this becomes, uh, if you don't carry a level, this becomes an important technique, let's say, uh, if there's an obstruction in the view somewhat. So let's say you're just over the crest of a hill. And uh, the instrument man, she's shooting you, but she's only seeing the top of your rod. She can't see you. She's shooting over your head. But she can see the top of the rod. So it's something like this. So maybe uh, she's seeing that top, but she can't see me because there's an obstruction. So I can't tell i can't see her she's making hand signals at me that i'm out uh that i'm not vertical it doesn't make a difference i can't see it so that's when i do this little pendulum motion back and forth back and forth uh, and that takes care of that so uh there may, there's a lot of jokes about the robin it's like oh that's that's the dude with the stick and uh in a survey crew, you know, there'll be a lot of joking going around that the Rodman is where the new person, uh, oh, we're going to put you up as a Rodman. And then you sign. And when I started out as a survey crew, I started as a Rodman. That's a very important role. And if the Rodman does not do it correctly, then the numbers that are taken by the instrument man and recorded are going to be wrong. So uh, it may not seem as glamorous. Is running the instrument, it's just as vital and important. And so ideally what you want on your survey crew is you want to rotate between the three positions. So you send your three-person crew out and uh, on the first day, you know, maybe Sarah's the instrument and Tom is the rod and Bob is recording. And in the second time, Sarah is going to do the rod, Tom's going to record, and Bob's going to do the instrument. And then on the third time, 
uh, you flip it around again, Bob is out on the rod, Sarah's recording, and uh, oh, I think I had that right. So it's like a round robin. So you, you want to make sure that every person on your survey crew knows how to do each function of the survey crew. And that becomes important, too, let's say that uh, for some reason uh, Bob can't show up for work that day. He's sick. And so you have to have someone else come in. Let's say, uh, oh, uh, Jeff comes in as a substitute. Well, you want to make sure that Jeff knows how to run each part of the survey crew. Because you got a substitute now. So you don't want it where one person is doing the same function each and every time. Because if that first person is not there, uh, then you're going to have problems. Or if that person doesn't do the job very well, let's say they make an error on it, uh, then you're going to have some biases and some problems with your data too. And that's also a way to check to see if there are any errors. If you rotate uh, who's doing what position around, that actually takes care of that issue of uh, errors. And you may find out, oh, well, I wasn't quite doing this right. Maybe I read the instrument and I'm reading it wrong. Maybe I'm doing it wrong. Maybe I don't have it level correctly. And that's a good quality insurance, quality control check to make sure that you know that the numbers that you are getting are true and good. Because at the end of the day, people are relying on you to make sure that your numbers are good. If I'm building the bridge, and let's say I decide I'm going to build a cantilever from both sides and then meet in the middle. And we've all seen those pictures. We want to make darn sure that when we meet in the middle, we're where we're supposed to be and not a few feet off. Or uh, that if we're crossing like a, a canyon and we're crossing from one side to the other, that the elevations are correct, that we actually don't hit the canyon wall when we get to the other side. So there's a lot of potential, or even property lines. And uh, a personal anecdote, when I had my house in Little Rock, my neighbor wanted to redo uh, the fence along our property lines. So uh, I got out my survey and uh, resurveyed it based on my survey. And I said, no, this is where the fence is supposed to go. Well, he got out his survey. And the fence line on his survey was different than the fence line on my survey. The property line was different. So where my existing fence was, which I thought was property line, because uh, according to the survey I had, it was, it really wasn't on the property line. It was actually off into his yard, uh, a few feet, actually. Uh, and since his survey was more recent than mine, that's the one that we, we, by agreement, we said, we'll go by the most recent survey. So his survey was more recent, so that's what we went by. So this can really cause issues uh, if something's done wrong. So two surveys, exact same property boundary, two different answers. Somewhere, somebody made a mistake. Mistakes happen. That's just all part of being human. Somebody made a mistake. Uh, surveyor one or surveyor two, nobody knows. So that's why it's so important to have that check. And it may have been something simple. They didn't have something leveled or uh, weren't holding the rod right or misread uh, the chain when they measured the distances. Something wasn't right. So something was off. And uh, luckily, my neighbor and I, we got along great, and we just mutually agreed we would go with his because it was a more up-to-date survey than mine. And that's where we put the new facts. So that's why it's important to cross train to know every aspect of it, uh, not only in case somebody's not there, but in case somebody's making a blunder or an error, and that way you can catch it, because if the results start coming back differently from the exact same uh, location, if you've got different people running the instrument or different people on the rod, then that's an indication that something was wrong. Something's not working right. I'll set that little guy over here. And I'll set my level. Another valuable piece of equipment 
that you'll find is very handy, and I've used these a lot as a servant, is a sledgehammer. Uh, when you're putting in uh, uh, markers, uh, they're either a hub, and a hub is a square one, and that's one that we use as a benchmark, as a survey stake, uh, if you want to call it that, or a lath, and a lath is just a, a slender piece of wood. They, they call it a stake, most people call them stakes, but the technical term is a lath. And uh, think about house construction with plaster and lath walls. That's how, that's why it's a lath, uh, because it's the same material that you find in a plaster and lath wall. You got to get the things in the ground. Uh, sometimes uh, we're using metal, like a fence pole, and that becomes an official, um, I've had to use these for my right away markers, uh, which were metal. So there's various uh, reasons why you need a sledgehammer, but it becomes a very important tool when you're out in the field. You've got to have a way to uh, hammer in your survey marks. And uh, a little hammer, a lot of times just isn't going to be enough. A good sledgehammer. Another tool that's pretty important, a hatchet. Uh, a lot of times you'll be out in an uh, area where it's overgrown with vegetation. And you got to clear a path. You either got to clear a path, uh, you got to clear a line of sight. Uh, even a total station cannot see through vegetation. So you have to have a clear line of sight between your instrument and your prism. Uh, if you do it the older way and you use uh, a chain, you have to have a clear path. Hatchets become very important. So this is one that's a hatchet and a hammer uh, at the same time. So in case I don't have a sledge, I do have a hammer for some smaller things. If I'm just doing a temporary, for example, uh, I'm just, let's say I'm doing a temporary mark, just someplace that I'm going to put my instrument there, so it'll be temporary, and if it goes away uh, in a day or so, I don't really care, then a little hatchet like this works out fine too. If you don't have a rod, uh, something like this will work. So what this is, uh, this is a four foot, it's a, it's a scale, it's a four foot scale. Uh, if I don't have a rod available, if I have something like this, that'll work. Um, and as long as I've got a level, and let's say I've got a stand or a tripod, I can actually mount this, uh, and I can't mount it completely on this one because I don't have enough clearance in my ceiling, but I can even hold it. And as long as I measure the distance from the ground to the bottom of my scale, I just add that on to whatever is being read, and that'll give me my elevations. So, and this is a very common way that people do it, um, especially if you don't have access to uh, a telescoping rod, uh, you can do this too. So this is a this this works uh, well. Uh, now, the only caveat on this particular scale is it's in inches. Typically, we use decimal feet. So, the typical scale, you'll see one foot, two foot, and then fractions thereof. This is in inches. So, this would require converting your numbers from inches to fractional feet. So, uh, We've introduced another possible source of error because if I don't do my conversions right, if I get a number wrong in my mathematics, the results are going to be wrong. So it's completely acceptable to use something like this uh, as long as you're confident that your conversions are fine. But if you're not confident in your conversions and you make an error, then you may get erroneous numbers. So uh, be cautious on that. If you're just looking at relative changes in elevation, an inches scale will work because you're just going to say, okay, it's eight inches different on there. And you can convert that eight inches into your fractional feet. 
So you can do it that way too. Uh, this works. It uh, on here. It, it's an acceptable way to do it. And again, if I were using something like this, I would make sure I have my little levels. I'd make sure I have my little level and uh, level this guy out. Um, but that's an acceptable way to do it. And uh, you can buy these at the hardware store for like 10 bucks. You know, there's some fancier ones that are about 20, but they're relatively inexpensive. Uh, they're easy to carry. You know, it's lightweight, it's not real bulky. And uh, if you're not doing anything where uh, precision has to be uh, to the hundredth of a foot. You know, if you got a, a plus or minus, a little bit of, uh, of leeway in there. So, a good example of where this would be useful is if I'm doing some rock grading, uh, like earth, or if I'm grading rock, because uh, I can't get it down to that fine of a level if I'm doing rough grading anyway. Because I'm going to have clumps bigger than a hundredth of a foot. So if I'm doing like a real rough grading and I'm only going to be grading to the tenth of a foot anyway, this is perfectly fine. The pools for distance, this is, uh, and the manufacturer of these is called roller tanks. Uh, and that's what it used to be called as a roller tank. Uh, it's a measure wheel is the technical term, but you'll hear people call it a roller tank. And this is actually, uh, that's because that's one of the manufacturers, is the roller tank corporation. And just a little uh, anecdote, when I first started out in the survey crew, they said grab a roll of tape, and I thought they meant a roll of tape. So I came back with this roll of tape, and they're like, no, it's a roll of tape. So this measures to, uh, you'll see these in inches, and you'll see them in uh, fractional feet. This one's to fractional feet. So it'll give me down to the tenth of a foot, and then I can kind of guess between that. It's like an odometer on a car, the, the old analog odometers. So I can kind of guess. Newer ones are actually digital. It can get you even better down to the hundreds of feet. Now, the, the kicker on that is as soon as I move this a little bit, it's going to move my meter. So you have to be very, very careful. And if you're getting a place with like a curb and gutter, uh, it's not going to go all the way. So you'll have to manually measure the distance from where it stops to the gutter. So, but these are very common. They're used a lot. <coughs> If you don't have uh, one of those four foot scales, uh, a good alternative here is a folding roll. And again, you can use a folding roll. Um, you know, it's sturdy. I would not use a tape measure. <clears throat> do not use a tape measure if you're if you're substituting if you're trying to do elevations because tape measure uh, isn't sturdy enough. Uh, Again, a folding rule is sturdy enough to do the job. Uh, I think this one is, what, a six-footer? So this is a little taller than my other one. And as long as I'm, I'm holding it, you know, good and plumb, uh, and I got my level on here, and I'm making sure that I'm not leaning. And, and we don't have to, it's not just this direction we got to worry about. We don't want it leaning forward or leaning back either. So we got to worry about it being... Uh, vertical in all directions. This works just fine. It, it's a good tool to use. I've used it uh, quite a bit, uh, you know, for most construction purposes. Uh, it's going to get you what you need. <coughs> Some other nifty little tools uh, that I wanted to show you. Uh, this little job here, what it does is it'll measure the angle. So if you put this on a, a slab or something, it'll actually show you the angle uh, in degrees that that is off of zero. So it's showing you what's level and it's showing you what angle you're at. So uh, if you do have something 
and maybe you can't get it <clears throat> or you want to see if you're off, uh, you can use that too. So that's a neat little device. This is a little digital one uh, that you can pick up. Some other neat little tools. Uh, this here is uh, measures distance. So it's a little laser. So you can see a little laser. And right now I'm measuring distance between myself and the wall behind me. And it's showing it's about eight feet. So there's a wall behind where my camera is right now. And from where I'm standing, it's eight feet. This one is pretty neat because I can do angles with it. So uh, if I have a horizontal and I have an angle, I can set it to calculate what the vertical is. So uh, this would allow me, let's say I have a scale. And uh, I'm shooting the vertical, you know, and I want to know what the vertical is. I can't see part of it, or I want to know what the horizontals are. I can use this in a variety of different ways to calculate uh, <clears throat> what those angles are. So uh, this is a neat little, uh, this one's got a range of 100 feet. They come in different ranges. This one's got a range of right around 100 feet. So for smaller distances, uh, this is a pretty effective uh, little device, and it'll tell you whether or not you're actually uh, shooting uh, actually vertical, I mean, uh, I'm sorry, horizontal with my measurements because of that angle function. Or what I can do is I just put my level up against this and make sure that I'm holding, or I can even uh, mount it to a tripod like this one. And since I know the tripod, I get the tripod level, I can mount this to a tripod, and I can measure some distances this way. So this is one of those laser uh, distance measures. It's just a, uh, uh, a smaller and uh, <clears throat> a smaller version of what Surveyors would use this for. So, and again, for small distances, uh, especially if I'm inside a structure and I'm trying to get some points, or maybe I'm in a, a, a going from pier to pier on a bridge, this would work perfectly as well uh, to get some distances, as long as I have something to point to. Uh, and I don't know if you've ever seen these. These are those laser levels uh, that we use to level out things. So when you turn it on, uh, it shoots out a little laser beam. And I level it in all directions, and it'll give me a point of where the exact level is on there. So the top of the line is level that I have on the wall. Uh, let me see if I can show it on here. Yeah, you see that on the wall? So I've got my own laser level here. And again, if, if I just need to do something in a pinch, a very quick measurement, uh, I can use this. And let's say I'm doing some uh, rust grading, and I want to see how you know how much I'm going downhill, or if I'm even am going downhill, I could use a device like this uh, to very, very quickly ascertain uh, what's happening. So I wouldn't use it for uh, setting property pins or setting benchmarks, but for simple uh, construction, if you just you know want to see what's going on. Uh, see if you're level or not. Uh, it's a perfectly acceptable tool to use. And again, I'll show you my little uh, other one. So uh, I'm back to the first one. See my little dot back there? And I'm going to stand right here by the camera. And what this is telling me, and as I move it, I am at just about 15 feet. And this is in inches, but it's 15 feet 5 inches. From where the camera is to the wall on the back side. So you see the dot? That's 15 feet 5 inches. A couple more little tools that you might be interested in. Uh, a lot of times when we set up, we're setting up over a particular point, and ideally you want to have a plumb bob. Uh, but if you can't, Find a plumb bob. There's a way you can do it. This is fishing wire and uh, a screw that's in a lead anchor. And it acts very similar to a plumb bob. And so 
because if I'm trying to set up over a particular point, so let's say I'm taking shots over a point, I'm at a benchmark, I've got to set up over that point. I've got to make sure that when I set my tripod up, I'm actually centered over that point and not off. Uh, newer instruments and tripods actually have a little scope that will let you look down on the point that you're trying to set up over. If you have an older instrument like this, uh, you just attach a plumb bob, and if the plumb bob is over the point, you're done. If it's not, you have to move. So here, I didn't have a plumb bob on me. So what I used is this is an old lead anchor and some fishing line, and I made a plumb bob on me. And if you're if you've got two people and you're pretty close, uh, what you can do. If you want to get level real quick, uh, this is what's called, you can see this, it's a string line. And what this does is this hangs off the string. So let's say I'm string lining something, I can just stretch the string. Uh, let's see, let's see if I can get this over here. I wrap that and I stretch my string. And I try and get that string uh, when I see the bubble in the middle. I know right here I'm up that this part of the string line is low. So, and of course, n normally you'd attach this to something in the back and you're trying to get this to be level, uh, but that's what this is. This is what's called a string line level, uh, and they're just, they're like $10 uh, at the hardware store, uh, but it's a nice little tool to have, especially, uh, again, if you just need something very simple uh, to get kind of a simple line of elevation or a simple line of sight is a string line level. Uh, they also have something called a hand level, and it's about this big, and it's literally this scope, but you hold it in your hand. And uh, I've used those quite a bit too. Uh, the only caveat is you have to have a very, very steady hand. And if you're taking multiple shots, you cannot move. You can only pivot your shoulder, and you have to make sure you stay at the exact same elevation as you pivot around. So uh, it takes a little bit of practice to use it. But surveyors who have used these a lot uh, are very good, and uh, they get very good results. So I hope you've enjoyed uh, my little introduction here, and uh, thank you for tuning in.